And I'm going to pass it over to Amanda, who is our Vice President of Positive Incorporated. Hi. It is um, great to be here tonight. My name is Amanda Nurstad. I am also an ALK positive patient in our support group with, with everyone. Um, I was diagnosed in 2016. I'm also serving as the vice president of ALK positive incorporated. So I just wanted to give a few updates tonight. Um, if you haven't already, please sign up for our ALK Summit 2022. It will be in Denver on July 29th, 30th and 31st. Um, we, it'll be a hybrid event, so we will be in person and you can choose to do online if you prefer. Um, so please sign up for that. And if you are already signed up, please join our um, Facebook group called Alk Positive Summit 22. I'm going. And there you will get um, more updates and information just so we don't flood our support group with all of the Alk Summit um, information. So it's called Out Positive Summit 22 dash I'm going. So please join that Facebook group um, if you haven't already um, and sign up for Out Positive Summit um, 22. We, it, the, it, you should have gotten your newsletter on it. And if you haven't already signed up for our newsletter, please, um, please do on our website at outpositive.org. Also, in the month of May, we have our Walk Positive fundraising event, um, and we are hoping to get some um, great donations from everyone in your team for to go towards the mission of Out Positive, which is to improve the quantity and quality of life of Out Positive patients worldwide. Um, and as you, everyone knows, we have $1.5 million out. Uh, we are partnered with Longevity to uh, let's fund some research. Let's fund some out positive research. We're excited for that. And we also have another uh, grant out there for $750,000 with LCFA for um, more research. So pass that on to any oncologists and researchers. We, we want more great research. Um, and then that's about it that I have. And I'll pass it back over to Mark and Summer. Someone you want to make some of the announcements? Sure. What else do we have here? Um, next up on our April calendar, um, on April 24th, we have Dr. Ben Creelan from the Moffitt Cancer Center coming on. He is going to talk about one of the big buzzwords, um, new therapies coming uh, well, new for us, <laughs> coming to the ALK population, um, TIL therapy, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. So be sure to save the date. Of course, um, that will be recorded, but we would love to have you there. Um, and also definitely check out um, our Healing Arts calendar for April. Um, we have lots of uh, events. If you have not attended one yet, be sure to um, check out um, Guided Imagery or the Death Cafe, or maybe you need some art therapy, whatever. We'd love to see you. All right, we're going to do some polling questions uh, in a minute here. And uh, I got a, a kind of funny question here. The first question You guys see that? How many lobes do you have in your lungs? I love that you included this one, Mark, which I did get wrong <laughs> when we talked. It's going to be like the best drink you've ever had in your life. But uh, OK, here we go. And, and Paul, Summer, share the results. Hold on as I get really close to see the answers. OK, 45% of us that got it right with the answer of five. Woohoo! Uh, wait, can everybody see the results or no? I just read them all. No, I think we can see them. Oh, okay. Good, good, good. So, so you... only 45% of us got it right. Yeah. So some of the next answer was four, and the next answer was two. So that is not a good way to start our <laughs> session, but uh, <laughs> which maybe is good. Okay. Second question. Have you ever consulted with a thoracic surgeon? Great question. After tonight, you can say yes. Sure. All right, I'm gonna end this poll and I'm sure there's all summer. Okay, half and half, right? Kind of right down the middle. Um, yeah, 
49% yes, 51% no. I know myself when I was first diagnosed was like, just get out the tumors. They're like, well, both your lungs are covered in tumors. That's not really an option, but we'll find out. Could today, could that be in my future? <laughs> okay, next, last question. And this, this is multiple choice. The first two top answers. Have you ever had lung surgery? If yes, what procedures? No surgery, you answer no. And I'm sure I missed some of the other procedures. But, but that was good, Mark. You did a good job with the variety there. Although Thanks, I had to Google it. But, <laughs> so here Dr. We Google, we talked about him in the green. Yeah. All right, Summer. Okay, and this is what we would expect, right, for the majority of us being stage four, 78% said no, 15% yes, some lobectomies, okay, very interesting. All right, I'm going to move on to our speaker, the speaker we have, uh, Dr. Raja Flores, um, is the Chief Thoracic Surgeon um, at the Mount Sinai Hospital, and he also is a professor of cardiothoracic surgery at Mount Sinai in New York City. So uh, Dr. Flores, please unmute and join us in the Zoom room. Woohoo! <laughs> Do we lose Dr. Flores? <laughs> wow. Wait, that really- I ever, This has never happened. Oh, here you go. Uh -huh. I can see you on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> Well, th thanks for having me. I I'm happy to be here. Like, uh, like Mark said, I'm a thoracic surgeon. I've been practicing thoracic surgery for, uh, I don't know, about 30 years. Uh, I was uh, at Columbia, then at the Brigham in Boston. Then I was at Sloan Kettering uh, for 10 years. Uh, I've been at Mount Sinai for the past 12 years. And three main cancers that I deal with, uh, number one, uh, lung cancer. Uh, number two is esophageal cancer, and the other one is mesothelioma, the cancer you get from asbestos. Uh, so dealing with all of those cancers has exposed me to a wide range of surgical procedures that we do for one, and sometimes we try and apply it to other cancers. So uh, I'll be happy to try and give you an insight into what a surgeon is thinking of uh, when we see somebody uh, with, uh, with a lung cancer, whether they're out positive or not, whether they're stage one, two, three, or four, um, there is no one uh, right way to treat it. It depends on each individual. Uh, and like I explained to the team before, I'm probably going to learn more from you guys today than you're going to learn from me. Uh, and so please feel free to ask me anything. The only stupid question is a question you don't ask. They told me in, in when I was in college, but uh, I don't know. So I mean, let me ask you, let's start us off first with the uh, obvious. I mean, what's the difference between an out-lung cancer patient and a lung cancer patient? Is there a difference? I, I, I couldn't hear you. Okay, can you hear me better now? Yeah, go, go ahead. Right. What is there a difference between an out-lung cancer patient and a lung cancer patient? So each patient that has a mutation is, um, uh, you need to take that mutation into account. Sometimes mutations can help predict survival, and sometimes mutations can help predict uh, response to treatment. Uh, the out positive patients tend to have a favorable response to, to the TKI uh, drugs. And so that's why it's important to take that into consideration. There are many other uh, treatment options, uh, chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery. And you want to try and find the combination that fits best for your particular case. Uh, you know, so um, with every patient, that's how you have to think about it. Not just, uh, I think too many people focus on, all right, surgery, cure, and, and that's not uh, everything. Surgery is one way to treat these cancers. Not everybody that has surgery is cured, and not everybody that doesn't have surgery dies. Uh, if you're in my office, you'll see patients sitting around 10, 15 years later, 
whether they had curative surgery or whether they did not have surgery. Um, maybe they had some other minor procedure that I helped them out with. Uh, so you just cannot generalize as far as doom and gloom or uh, when you have a lung cancer diagnosis. But we do have the advantage with the TKIs. And the, and the, do you have an hard time hearing me? I'm sorry, maybe my computer. Say it again. I said you do have a difference with the durable response that we have from our TKIs. Mm -hmm. So in, in the case of a lot of us who are in the audience, they start a TKI and the disease progression stops. And it, it, it's back to the primary tumor, which is in the lung. So do you see those patients a lot? Um, so it, it, it depends on, um, you know, many times you'll get treatment and everything will shrink. And before doing surgery, you want to make sure that there's nothing distant in the body, that there's not, that all the tumors contained within the chest, within that lung, within a lobe or within the entire lung. And what you got to realize is that not all stage fours are the same. You may have a stage four where you just have a lymph node that's up here. Uh, you may have a stage four where your bones are riddled with it, your brain is riddled with it, your liver is riddled with it, and both lungs to the point where you can't breathe. And when you're looking at survival, you have to realize that they lump all of these together. There's more of a difference within stage four than there is between one, two, and three. So if you have stage four with a solitary metastases, that's very different than somebody that has 60 or 70 metastases. And I think that's very important when you're trying to figure out what's best for you. So let's say you've had uh, a lung cancer where you have something that's in a regional lymph node. Um, and uh, regional, I mean a, a lymph node that's close to the cancer, distant, a lymph node far away from the cancer. And so we like to not just do surgery when you have lymph nodes. We want to combine it with chemotherapy or targeted therapy or radiation therapy and not just use surgery alone. So if you have uh, a good response, let's say you have tumors that are distant and you have a response. What do I mean by a response? It's pretty simple. You get a CAT scan. If the tumor is smaller, you know you had a response. You know your drug is working. If the tumor is bigger, then you know the cancer, the drug is not working. And it's really just that simple. So what happens if you have a cancer, you get the drug, let's say in, in a, a TKI uh, for Al, and it's not working. The tumor is getting bigger. You need to change that drug. You need to try something different. Now, let's say you tried something different. Let's say you're a stage four patient uh, who's out positive, and I'm responding to Eileen Lamb's question in the, in the question. So let's say you have a stage four lobectomy and you're out positive. And let's say you're stage four uh, because of some lymph nodes. And then you get the treatment and all those lymph nodes go away. What's the next step? right? You do a biopsy of the lymph nodes that are far away and you find out, wow, there's no cancer there. Um, and then you realize the only spot of cancer is in that lobe. In that situation, you would do a lobectomy. Now, is it a guarantee that you can cure that patient? No, but if you can do a lobectomy, then you've rendered the patient NED, no evidence of disease. And, and that's really what you try and get. Uh, but the thing that's better than no evidence of disease, even if you have disease, is you're alive 10 years, 20 years later. And that's the ultimate goal. So what you want to make sure is you don't hurt yourself trying to get NED um, because you heard somebody else had this treatment. There are some of my patients that are running around who've had uh, something called an extra pleural pneumonectomy, where they've had their entire lung removed, the lung, the lining of the lung the covering of the heart, the diaphragm, and everyone will say, well, why can't I have that operation? And it depends on uh, your whole situation. Um, 
I see another, do people who have lobectomies and are NED still take TKIs? Um, that's a good question. I think it depends on the oncologist and it depends on the particular uh, patient. I think it depends whether or not when you took out the tumor, is there still tumor cells that are viable in the lymph nodes that you removed? Uh, in those situations, you would think the risk of recurrence would be on the higher side. So sometimes you want to continue on the TKIs. Um, the reason why many people try to get the cancer out is because we know that the TKIs sometimes may only last one to two years, uh, and then they stop working. And that's when you have to shift things around. So you have a window of opportunity where surgeons and medical oncologists will try uh, to remove cancers um, uh, in that situation, but it's not, it, there's no one size fits all. And you're also going to take into account radiation. Uh, some people didn't go to surgery. They got radiation to their lobe, and then they've, uh, they're getting their, their medical treatment. And so uh, one of the questions is, can you have a lobectomy after radiation? Yes, you can. You can have a lobectomy after radiation. It puts you at a little bit of a higher risk because there's more scarring. So from the surgeon's standpoint, we have to do a little more work in dissecting and cutting, uh, but, uh, but it is very possible and sometimes we do it. But the bigger question is, uh, why did you get a radiation to begin with? Why didn't you start with surgery? And usually that will be because there's been tumor that is in a place that really surgery doesn't get. Like if a lymph node is, is up over here or, or outside of the chest. And you can get, uh, are you recommending chemo after surgery lobectomies? Uh, it depends on, uh, on the findings. So why would you recommend chemo, right? Because when we find cancer early, that's the chance when it's the most curable, when it's a stage one. And let's say after you take something out, you realize, oh, it's not a stage one, it's actually a stage three. What do you do in that situation? Then with that situation, you do give chemotherapy. You do give targeted therapy if they're fortunate enough to have an ALK mutation or an EGFR mutation, or now we're looking at pdl one for immunotherapy. Um, but if they are a healthy patient with an early stage uh, cancer, surgery is the treatment that is the gold standard. Uh, that's the treatment that's associated <clears throat> with the best survival, uh, the lowest recurrence rate, uh, and the best chance for a cure. If for some reason you can't get surgery, then radiation is a good alternative. Can you hear me now? No. <laughs> I'm disconnecting my earbuds. <laughs> So, um, can, you, can you hear me better now? Yes. Uh, no. About that. So, I know there's a, a, a bunch of questions that came in with, without any order, but I mean, I'm backing up. So, a thoracic surgeon, how does it work in a, with, the, with, the, with the oncologist and the team? When are you involved in that? So, I think. The majority here are advanced or stage four outpatients, am I right? And if that's the case, then the way surgeons work with the oncologist are a number of ways in, in that situation. Um, many times the oncologist will, will have the patient on a TKI, uh, will give them chemotherapy, will do radiation, and then sometimes what you'll find is that everything that was in other parts of the body goes away and that they're left with a single focus. And usually that's when they try to get the surgeon to take something out. And the difference between doing a lobectomy and doing a pneumonectomy for a cancer patient has nothing to do whether you think one's a better operation or not. It has to do with the location of the tumor. If the tumor is isolated to a lobe, you do a lobectomy. If the location of the tumor is in the middle of the lung, near something that we call the hilum, 
which is close to the heart, that's when you have to do a pneumonectomy. So the theory behind surgery is wherever you cut, you want that to be clean and you want to be able to take everything out with it. And that's the main point of surgery is to cut out the cancer in a clean way so that the patient doesn't really have any disease left in their body. If you're going to be cutting across cancer and leaving cancer behind, you probably shouldn't have surgery in that setting. Now, is it more, uh, if you have had radiation to the lung and then the lung starts increasing in size with the metastasis in the lung itself, is that more difficult to take out because it's been radiated? Um, you can still save lung even though it's been radiated. Um, but many times that would indicate to me the patient probably had a more advanced cancer within that area where they didn't want to do surgery to begin with. Uh, sometimes if they have poor breathing uh, function. Now, many of the ALPs are non-smokers, uh, but uh, many of the patients will uh, out there are smokers who have damaged lungs uh, and they can't take any more out. But with the ALP patients who were never smokers, um, you have more room to do bigger surgery because the remaining lung is uh, actually working uh, pretty well because it didn't have much of an insult. Gotcha. And then the, seizure, the procedures themselves, VATS, everyone says VATS, and you explain the different procedures that you do do. So VATS is called uh, short for Video Assisted Thoracic Surgery. Uh, that's a minimally invasive way of taking cancers out. Sometimes you can use the robot with it, which is called the Da Vinci robot, intuitive. And even though that's the biggest thing that patients focus in on, oh, is it minimally invasive? Are you using the robot? That's all actually um, uh, not what you should be focused in on. You want to make sure that you focus in on having a good cancer operation. Sometimes that's done with VATS. Sometimes it's done with open. Uh, you have to realize as surgeons, we're human beings too. And many times surgeons will use these catchphrases that they know patients hang on to in order to build their practice, in order to build uh, their academic reputation. Uh, I would make sure you find someone you trust and you put it in their hands. That being said, I've, I've been doing minimally invasive surgery for decades. Uh, and so I saw how as it developed, that was used, and I'm guilty of it as well, to try and improve your uh, notoriety, your stature. Uh, but um, at this point now, I think, um, you know, I'm comfortable just saying, you know, some of that is BS. And you want to just focus on... Uh, what they're going to do to get rid of your cancer uh, in the right way so that you're alive 10 years, 20 years later. Who cares if you have a couple small holes if they're leaving cancer behind? Um, you know, I tell them, listen, fillet me open if, if that's going to save me. Uh, I see another question here, stage four. Now on PDA. So stage 2B, bilobectomy, open thoracotomy, followed by chemo, now on TKIs for three years as experimental treatment to ward off recurrence. Would love your thought. Um, so the fact that nothing, I assume nothing has shown up in three years uh, could be a couple of reasons. It could be maybe you're cured. Uh, it could be that the TKIs are keeping things at bay right now. Um, uh, either way, that's fantastic news. And I think that, you know, you just have to be watched carefully. And let's say something pops up. You're not sure. Is this cancer? Is it scar tissue? There's never a rush um, to do something. I know you always feel when you're a patient, oh my God, uh, and you know you have a cancer and it's here. I needed it out yesterday. No, there's no rush. If this cancer is going to kill you, uh, very quickly, there's nothing we have that's going to stop it. But thank God, most cancers don't behave that way. Most cancers, you have time. Now, there are some cancers that are rabbits. It's going to bounce around and it's going to kill you like this. We can't stop that. Then you have cancers that are turtles, where they're just kind of hanging out there. They're not doing anything. And, you know, whether you operate or not, whether you treat or not, doesn't matter. 
Then you have these cancers that are like medium speed. Those are the ones that we can really make an effect on. Those are the ones where screening works. Those are the ones where if you've had a, a, a treatment response, that maybe we should consider surgery in, in those situations. You want to tackle this question about the stage four elk uh, that he was told surgery was not an option. Obviously, it's a pretty broad question, but are most stage four cancers when they're out, out of the lung and then they come back where they're treated and they're back to the primary tumor, those are typically not candidates for surgery because they're out of the lung? Well, I think every case is different. You know, we've had uh, patients where they have a solitary metastasis to the adrenal or a solitary metastasis to the brain. You remove the metastases, you remove the thing in the lung. So it depends on uh, each individual's situation. Uh, there's never a one size fits all. And um, so uh, nothing is ever surgery is not an option. Now, typically when you're stage four, the medical oncologist is gonna tell you where your stage four uh, surgery isn't done in that situation. Surgery is not done in that situation right off the bat, but if you get treatment and you get a response and over a period of time, six months, a year, you get a feel of the biology of this particular tumor. How is it behaving? Is it going slowly? Is it going to just certain parts of your body? Remember, you know, the seed soil thing, uh, tumor metastases will only grow in the soil uh, that allows them to grow. So is it just going to your lung? Is it just going to a certain part of your body? If it looks like that's what's happening, then you may be justified in cutting out the thing in your lung and cutting out the thing in your adrenal gland. Uh, and, and there's no, I would never say never, especially when you're a couple years down the line and they've experimented with different types of drugs uh, you can experiment with different types of surgery as well. The one thing I always tell my patients is that, listen, if we get this out, that's a guaranteed complete response. Now, what we hope is that guaranteed complete response is going to translate into a survival benefit and that you're not going to get hurt from the surgery, that you're not going to get hurt from missing that part of the lung. Uh, if someone's running a marathon, I want to make sure the surgery we do on them will allow them to continue to run a marathon. Um, so it, there's no, in my mind, uh, never. And especially when you're stage four, um, if you've uh, undergone many treatments and you want to know if surgery is in your best interest, talk to a surgeon, email me, send me the pictures. I'll take a look at it. Um, so uh, I think that's, uh, I look at tons of people's films all the time, you know, just over the phone. And, um, uh, you know, you don't have to come all the way to New York. And, uh, and I think, you know, sometimes we'll look at stuff and say, no, surgery is not the right thing uh, to do. But sometimes we look at it and we say, you know what, surgery may be in your best interest. There's some good chat questions that you might want to thumb through. So stage four, remove the primary to hopefully slow down. So <clears throat> the question is, uh, Stage four, remove the primary, hopefully slow down the out, uh, lung cancer, then continue on a TKI. I do get that. There's been some evidence out there that resecting uh, the primary, at least for breast cancer, may help uh, sort of decrease these circulating uh, tumors. I think a lot of that is conjecture, uh, but I never will discount the... Uh, consideration of removing a primary cancer. Uh, for me, the rate limiting step is how good a shape is that patient? Will they be able to tolerate the surgical procedure uh, without it hurting them? Uh, and I think that's the main thing is, you know, I would take out every damn cancer out there. I don't care where everything is. If I was positive that that patient would not have uh, pain, would not have a compromised quality of life, would not, um, you know, lose some lung function. So we're always using that balance. Uh, how are we doing with getting rid of the cancer and improving survival versus how are we doing with the treatment, which is the surgery 
and the attending morbidities that come with that. Uh, I see another question here from Emily. Do surgeons ever consider pneumonectomy for a stage four patient with pleural effusion uh, at diagnosis that is resolved? Yes, there's a number of patients out there, and this is where the cross-fertilization takes place. I've operated on a ton of mesothelioma patients, uh, the cancer you get from asbestos, and that's where you have tumor that's growing in the pleural space, that uh, you develop a pleural effusion. And in a number of lung cancer patients, I saw that um, a number of these patients, even with the pleural fluid, didn't develop bone mets, brain mets. It didn't go anywhere. It just stayed in that chest. So I sort of considered that, well, maybe we can do the mesothelioma operation for those patients, which is uh, called an extra pleural pneumonectomy. And that's where you take out the lung, the covering of the lung, the lining of the heart and the diaphragm. Um, and we've had a number of patients who have done well with that. It's not an operation I will do uh, lightly. It's an operation that I make sure the patient knows this is completely out of the box. People may think it's the wrong thing to do. Um, and I basically let the patients dictate it. I have to, number one, see that there's a fire in them that they will uh, get over surgery. Because the surgery, you're, you're not going to die on the table. What kills you with surgery is um, the recovery. If you know you can't get out of bed, you get a pneumonia, you get a blood clot, you get a pulmonary embolus, that's what kills you. It's very uncommon for someone to die on the table. Uh, yes, it can happen, but with you know the 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 stuff that we see, it's really uh, are you going to get hurt postoperatively after surgery? See the question again. And <clears throat> Infection occurs in the initial area yeah. in the lung after being stable for a few years. Would surgery be more beneficial as compared to radiation? That's a good question. Uh, I think that's many, uh, many people wonder that. The way I look at it, if I think the surgery can be done with a less than 1% complication or mortality rate, then it may be something to consider. Uh, Radiation, it depends where the tumor is located. Is it near a structure that's going to be hurt by the radiation? You know, the, the side effects, even though radiation um, uh, is, is not immediately more life-threatening than surgery, when you look months down the line, there are issues with radiation. You can get radiation pneumonitis, uh, which can hurt you, esophagitis. Uh, there are a lot of things where the effects of the radiation uh, can, can, can hurt you, can potentially kill you. Uh, you know, I think many people look at surgery as immediately life-threatening, uh, but chemo, uh, people die with chemo, people die with targeted therapy, people die with radiation, and yes, people die with surgery. So you're always trying to weigh that balance as far as what is in this particular patient's best interest. Let me just jump in real quick about uh, going through a tumor board, you know, stage four lung cancer, you sit in many tumor boards. Uh, who has the weight in that tumor board? Is it the oncologist, yourself? You know, how, how does that get played out? So the tumor board is a very useful thing, not just for patients, but for treating physicians. So in our tumor board, we have it every Wednesday morning. There's routinely about 40 to 50 people at our tumor board, a combination of uh, uh, our 12 surgeons, uh, oncologists, radiation doctors. Uh, we have a proton uh, person who's there. Uh, we have um, uh, basically every, every kind of treatment person there. And we also have pulmonologists as well. So the tumor board is essential in helping not just uh, direct what you should do, but giving you ideas as far as what you should not do as well. So let's say something makes sense to you and you say, you know what, she's 28, she's got two young kids at home, I want to do this. And as a doctor, you, you, you get emotional, you want to you wanna save this patient. And so you can present it and then you hear the feedback from people. 
uh, oh, what are you crazy? You can't do this on this patient. Or you hear them say, wow, that's a great idea. Let's go for it. And when you have 40 people saying, let's do it, then that's something that as a surgeon, you feel comfortable taking that patient to the OR. Uh, every patient is different. And every, you know, the treatment for a 28 year old with a couple of kids is very different than an 88 year old with the same stage tumor who's in a wheelchair. Uh, it, it's very different. And you just got to learn how to apply the treatment tools that you have uh, to get the best outcome. But the main thing that I would say is never say never. Uh, with every patient, there is always hope. I've had patients where I'm like, all right, this patient's gone in a month and I have to tell the family because I just need them to be prepared. And next thing you know, 10 years later, I was absolutely wrong. So I love it. I love it when that happens. So I'm very careful to not give bad news until I think they're gone in the next week. Uh, and, uh, you know, having stage four, having lung cancer, it's just not a death sentence. Uh, I, we see it time and time again. So I, I think you got to make sure that, you know, when you don't have a death sentence like that and you're playing whack-a-mole, this is popping up, this is popping up, you keep trying new things. Uh, there's no right answer. You know, patients don't read the book. So you started uh, in 1992 and this is 2022 the advances that you've seen, um, what do you think the future might hold? So I think the advances have been impressive. Um, you know, people are living longer now with the treatments that we have. The saddest thing that I see is that only 5% of patients who are eligible for lung cancer CT screening are actually getting screened. That's the quick cure right there. 95% uh, of the people in this country uh, are eligible for lung cancer screening for a cure without any drugs, and they're not getting screened. So that's the grand slam right there. Um, the newer drugs, targeted therapy, immunotherapy, chemotherapy, it's all going in the right direction. If you look at breast cancer, the amount of advances that have uh, been done in breast cancer is just not a death sentence. And that is uh, sort of it being extrapolated to all the other cancers, including lung cancer. But uh, I do think we have an opportunity with screening in lung cancer uh, and, um, and we're just not jumping on. Now that doesn't really apply to the outpatients, uh, but uh, you know, I think when you have a family history, um, even though that's lightly associated as well or other things that may make you feel like, okay, I'm at risk for lung cancer. A CT scan is not that big a deal. It's the same x-ray uh, radiation as a mammogram. Got some good chat questions for you. Okay. Uh, did you see that uh, side effects for lung surgery in general? The biggest side effect is pain, uh, whether it's minimally invasive or not, there's always pain. And, um, and the biggest thing the pain doesn't allow you to do, it doesn't allow you to take a big, deep breath in. When you can't take a big, deep breath in, it allows the bacteria to multiply, and that's how you get pneumonia. And then you get a pneumonia, you're stuck in bed, you can't get up, and that's how you get a blood clot. And then the blood clot goes to your lungs. So the single most important thing that you can do after lung cancer surgery is to walk every day as much as you can. That's the single most important thing. And the single most important thing you can do before lung cancer surgery is to walk every day in preparation from it. You're training for something. Um, when are people eligible for screening for lung cancer? So there's a, a strict, um, uh, strict guidelines of people in their 50s with a certain lung cancer, uh, smoking history. Uh, but, you know, many of the people, like I said, with uh, EGFR or, or ALK uh, mutations, many of them are, are non -smoke, never smokers. And so uh, what we're doing now at Mount Sinai is trying to figure out how to screen patients who are non-smokers. Uh, and Claudia Henschke and David Yankalovitz are working on that. I don't exactly, uh, I can't give you any uh, enlightenment with regards to that. 
Uh, but if someone or a family member uh, wants to get screened, I'll, I'll screen them. I'll, I'll get a CAT scan on them. I, I don't think that it's, you know, that there's really any downside. Then people will talk to you with the screening about overdiagnosis, overtreatment. You hear this left and right. In my mind, there's no such thing as that. There's only overtreatment, not overdiagnosis. Uh, you know, if you see something on a CAT scan, you don't have to jump at everything. You don't have to cut it out. Main thing you don't want when you're having a CAT scan, whether it's a screening CAT scan or a yearly CAT scan or a six month CAT scan as a patient, is a surgeon or a doctor with a quick trigger finger. You don't have to jump and cut out everything that's there. Um, Whack-a-mole, uh, can you mention meds, please? Um, the meds thing, I, you guys probably know more about it than I do. When to take a first-line treatment or a second-line treatment. Uh, so I, I don't think I can shed any light on that. When I face with someone and I need to talk about uh, certain medications, I refer them to the medical oncologist. Uh, um, <laughs> can I back up to that one question? So I'm out of state, I come see you, I make an appointment, you look at everything. Do you contact my oncologist to go over everything or how does it work? So basically what, what I do with my patients is I say, I can't give you enough information on this. I want you to see your oncologist, let them look at the CAT scans and tell you what they would do. Then I say, after you see them, come back and talk to me. And then I'll tell you what I would do if you're my own family member. So after they see the medical oncologist and they're informed, then sometimes I say, yes, go with that treatment. Sometimes I'll say, you know what? I don't think you should treat this right now. We're not sure what that is. It could be fibrosis. It could be scarring. Let's just get another CAT scan in three months and it just sort of make them feel comfortable. Listen, in three months, nothing's going to happen. This isn't going to be like, grow like wildfire. And so I'll try as a surgeon to just be another uh, sort of sounding board and, um, and someone that as a doctor is just telling them what I would do, uh, because many of the patients, you know, they, they just want direction. They don't necessarily, they, they know they have a situation where it's going to be difficult to cure them. They just want to be there for their family. So, um, I just try and tell them what I would do if, if they were my wife or my father or my mother or my, you know, child, uh, after using TKI for two to three years, it is likely that surgery will undertreat the remaining primary tumor in the lung. Uh, it depends on a bunch of different things. If that is the only site of disease and there is nothing anywhere else, you're always justified in considering surgery, always. Um, if surgery is not the best thing to do, if you think, okay, maybe that is not what's in this patient's best interest, maybe radiation. Uh, there are a bunch of different tools out there. Um, and the main thing that you want to make sure is whatever treatment you get is not making your life worse. Uh, you know, too many times people will treat for the sake of treating. Uh, sometimes there are drugs and treatments that really won't hurt you at all. But patients always want the hardest thing because they think that's the thing that's going to really help me. And that's not it. You need to be smart about it. You can't just think, you know, hit me with the kitchen sink. Uh, sometimes the kitchen sink ain't going to cure you. And it's just this little feather that can help you. And, and so it's important to sort of get as much information as possible. Um, and with that, you know, I, I try to make sure that uh, patients have, uh, you know, not only me as a surgeon, but other doctors that they can bounce things off of. And, and I'd encourage you guys to call or email other doctors. We, we respond. You know, it's not like, you know, oh, well, if I don't send a bill out for this. No, I get the paid the same every year, whether I do 200 cases or 400 cases. You know, we're, we're there, many of us who just, I mean, yeah, you'll have the rare person who's just, you know, a uh, shyster, but most of us, we really just want to help you guys. And, and so email us, call us. We'll, we'll look at stuff and try and give you direction. You know, I listened to one of your, your talks and you were giving a commencement speech and you said, most actors don't think of mind, body, spirit, which I thought was a very insightful response. So can you dig a little deeper into your, your thought about that? Yeah, no, I, uh, 
I didn't come up with that. I, I, it was written on the wall of, of my medical school. And I remember the first day I was walking in to medical school and it said, there is no greater privilege than to be entrusted with another person's mind, body, and spirit. And, and that just got me because it wasn't body. Mind was first. Spirit was, was third. It, body was sandwiched in between. And, you know, your body is your vessel uh, for your happiness, for your spirit, uh, for your brain. And, um, you know, sometimes we get lost treating this cancer and we lose sight of the patient that's there. You know, many times you're going to hear people talk about surgeons and they're going to say, oh, he's a, he's a big a-hole, but, you know, he's a fantastic surgeon. Run, run far away. All right, because what's the most important part of a surgeon? I've heard so many things. Oh, it's their brain. Oh, it's their hands. What are they, some freak of nature? No, it's their heart. If they care, they're going to do everything they can to study. If they don't understand a certain situation, they're going to put their ego aside and get somebody who can help them. Uh, they're going to do everything that they can to make sure that you're getting the best treatment. And, you know, just like other human beings, surgeons, I think people will say, especially surgeons, have these huge egos. You don't need someone with a huge ego. Uh, that's not going to be in your best interest, no matter what reputation is preceding this person. Make sure you feel like you got someone who just really wants what's in your best interest. And, and you know it as a patient. You can feel it. Um, uh, just don't listen to that uh, uh, false statement about, oh, well, yeah, he, he, don't worry about him. He's good in the award. That, that just doesn't work. So, you know, NGS is real big lately for the last couple of years, liquid biopsies. Um, do you have less um, biopsies that you're doing, tissue biopsies? No, I think the liquid biopsies is something that we're still trying to figure out, you know, figuring out the cell-free DNA and mutations in it. Uh, you know, you may be able to find more uh, people who uh, uh, are going to be responsive to targeted therapies without having to actually stick the patient just by taking some blood. Uh, it's an exciting area. I'm not sure how much it's going to affect uh, surgeons as far as how we treat patients, um, uh, but there it, it's going to come into play uh, down the line with Definitely stage four patients. Um, uh, with earlier stage, I think it, it's still evolving, but it, it will eventually have a role there. Um, I see another question here. How are you eligible for uh, fight months to get one being a non-smoker? Then it was still denied by insurance. Um, that's a good question. So if you're a non-smoker, but for some reason, you feel like you've been exposed to asbestos, you've had radon in your basement, um, you can get a scan. Uh, you just got to find a doctor that's going to do it. So you have a cough. Okay. Cat scan. Uh, you know, you're short of breath. Okay. Cat scan. You just can't say it's a screening scan. Um, yeah. The insurance companies, they hear me saying that they, they would jump on me, but you know what? Screw them. I've had to fight with them so many times for patients. They piss me off. So, uh, you know, I, I think you do what you think's in your best interest. And, um, uh, and if it means because you have a family member or someone uh, you're worried and you want a CAT scan, okay, instead of screening, put cough. Right, or headache and get a brain MRI. <laughs> I mean, you should actually, you know. <laughs> and then right. I see another thing here. Do you recommend the second booster? If they came out with the 10th booster, I'd recommend it. Um, you know, I think, you know, two years ago when, when COVID hit, uh, we got slammed. We had patients in... Um, Oh, second booster for COVID or second booster? Are we talking TKIs here? I'm guessing that means COVID. I don't That's know. what I'm thinking. I'm yeah. thinking. I'm thinking COVID. Um, so I'm more afraid of COVID than I am of the vaccine. Um, my scrub tech died of it. We had Eddie in the cafeteria that died of it. We've had nurses that died of it. My aunt, my uncle died of it. So I'm more afraid of COVID than I am of the vaccine. I haven't seen a single person get hurt from the vaccine. And when I look at the data, um, to me, the risk of COVID and its effects, I'm more scared of that than the vaccine. But I have people who are side by side with me 
going through this war as it was happening, who did not get vaccinated, who don't want to get vaccinated. And they saw the same thing that I saw. So I can't argue with that. Um, so it's a tough, it's a tough question as far as, you know, I, and they're not many, but there are a few nurses and doctors that just don't want to get vaccinated. And, and they've seen what I've seen. They've seen the, the, the suffering. Uh, so I can't say that I want to impose that on people. Uh, but I do believe the vaccines work and, and we should get vaccinated. Um, can the patient directly talk to you after the patient talked to his or her oncologist? Any, email me. Uh, I can talk to you. Now, if I get flooded with like 100 emails, it's going to take me some time. But I will talk to everybody. I promise you. Uh, it may take me time to get back to you, but yes, call me. And it's a, it, any cost involved? No. The only cost involved is for some reason I got to cut you open. Uh, and I don't even charge. It's the hospital that will charge you. Uh, I had a pulmonary test. I have 67% lung capacity diagnosed in January, started TKI in February. Thoughts on lung capacity? Um, so 67% is pretty good lung capacity. So uh, the main thing you want to make sure is that you have a response. So after you've been on the TKIs for a while, you get another CAT scan. Uh, did it get smaller? If you're feeling a little more short of breath, uh, then get a CAT scan. Does it mean that you've developed pneumonitis, meaning inflammation in the lung? Did you develop a pleural effusion fluid in the lung that's making it difficult to breathe? So you just got to constantly be in contact with your doctor. And if it takes more than two days uh, to speak to them, then, you know, I understand doctors are busy, but more than two days, I I'm not happy about that. You, you got to start looking for somebody else. You at least need to have a PA or someone that's going to get back to you. Um, Oh, provide my email. I'll put it right here. Okay. This is harder than when you get interviewed for running for mayor of New York. <laughs> that was my <laughs> midlife crisis. It's funny when I when I uh, googled your name, that was the first thing that came up. That's so I'm funny. like, this guy asked me the wrong guy. <laughs> so it's funny. The reason why I actually did it was from. It wasn't so much running to be mayor, it was running because of something that I was exposed to. So uh, at Mount Sinai, we're in between the poorest of the poor uh, in Spanish Harlem and the richest of the rich in the Upper East Side. And a number of my patients live in public housing and they were exposed to fungus, to lead, asbestos, and they are continuously exposed to it to the point where I've had to do surgery on them, where I've had to take out half of their lungs for fungus for, and what I realized was this was not a medical problem. This is a political problem. And, and no one was listening. I joined every activist group in Spanish Harlem and I, I couldn't do anything. I, I got nowhere. So I said, well, let me try uh, running for mayor. The thing that really kicked me into doing it was that many of the people who um, were suffering in public housing, half of them in Spanish Harlem are employees at Mount Sinai. So many of them I worked with when COVID hit, they kept coming to the hospital. It's not like they're living in public housing and they're getting a handout or they're getting welfare. They're working, they're paying rent. And I said, my God, what? we've got to do something. So I ran to bring a topic to the forefront and I could not get my message out. It just made me see a different angle of how corrupt politics are. You have to be corrupt to go into it. You have to have... Uh, big money. And I wasn't, like I said, I also have the Upper East Side. I wasn't about to ask the billionaires who are my patients to contribute to my campaign. I just wasn't going there. And I realized there's a part of your soul nowadays, the way it's set up that you have to sell to be a politician. I kind of just wanted to get that message out there. And the other thing that I learned was the role of the media. Uh, the media, they are in cahoots. At least this is, has been my experience with the Republican and the Democratic policies. If you look at it, they get about eight, $9 billion uh, from both parties for advertisements, et cetera. So they are not presenting you with all the data. There was something that came out in the New York Times that said, um, uh, Merrill Candidate Guide. And there's just two people in there, the Republican and the Democrat. And I'm looking, I'm like, oh, maybe, maybe I got a little bit of, of attention here. 
there was no independent. There were three independents running and they just, in here you have a doctor running in the time of COVID. Maybe he's got something to say. And they <laughs> wanted nothing. They knew exactly who I was. When we announced, we went to 150 different people. It's not like they didn't know who we were. They just, they didn't let you get any exposure. And I thought I was in with the media, which is why I said, let me run. I've been on TV. I've done all kinds of stuff. But there's a political person that's in charge at every media outlet and they control it. We, we do not get to choose. We're giving to people and that's it. So it made me realize down the line, maybe 10 years from now, I may want to run for public office just because screw them. But, <laughs> but now I know what I need to do. <laughs> you thought it was hard being a surgeon. <laughs> <laughs> I got to say it was fun. It was fun and it made me feel like, you know, I was born and raised in this country and, and this country has given me a lot and, and I love this country. And, um, uh, you know, my parents both were immigrants. And um, so I, I just felt like, wow, I finally engaged uh, with the system. And, um, and it's interesting. I mean, I guess somehow it works. Uh, I'm not happy with the way it's working, but it allowed me to come from, you know, poor background and get an education and be able to, you know, live the American dream. So I, I guess I can't be too critical of it. I like that. Um, well, you, you, you're, you're making us smile and live in the American dream. And <laughs> we really appreciate you coming on. And if anyone wants to reach out, I try to get a hold of Dr. Flores. I made one phone call, the PA answered, and it's as easy as simply Googling his name and you'll get a phone number, an email address, and uh, get some... Uh, I guess tough love. <laughs> I do have one quick question that we had posted of, from someone who couldn't be here, totally random. Um, when we were talking about like liquid biopsies versus um, tissue biopsies, um, and she had wondered she was going to have to have a biopsy. I think in a kind of a hard to reach place in her lung, and she wondered could she have a VATS procedure to do the biopsy. Um, what you, what she probably would benefit more from is a needle biopsy where the radiologist sticks a needle in there. Um, mm -hmm. it depends on the situation. If, uh, if it looks quick and easy to do a VATS biopsy and it actually looks like the information obtained would actually change her management, okay. um, or save her from getting a potentially toxic treatment, then I think it's worth it. But most of the time, if you have stage four, there are ways to get biopsies without actually going to surgery. Okay. Uh, so uh, a fine needle aspiration uh, would be something to think about in that situation. Awesome. Thank you so much. And really so appreciate it. We are grateful. You guys can unmute and say hello to Dr. Flores. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.